say, just stay true to being you. Amen. And so welcome to our second service. So grateful that you guys were able to make it out on today. Um, I am battling through uh, kickball on yesterday, and I feel like the Brindley family practiced all week long to ensure that their team will <laughs> win against my team. I don't know what, Amanda, she was like razor sharp, like David. I mean, these folks were throwing at folks and hitting them folks from like on the outfield. And so these folks were practicing. I took a dive. I landed on my hands. I got, I got pain in places that, that I haven't had pain in a long time. And so I'm working through it. And so we had an amazing time, though. It was awesome. And so if you missed it, make sure that you come out to these kickball games. It's been fun. It's been awesome. And we've been able to... Um, to enjoy ourselves, right, in community. So often uh, what we want or what we're lacking is a community, and oftentimes we, make, we put ourselves in the wrong communities and wonder, well, what's going on in my life, God? What, why, why am I having to deal with certain issues? Well, look at the people around you, and we'll tell you where you're going. Amen. We are halfway through the year, and these are the topics that we've been discussing all month long. We can look back the last six months and say, okay, what are some things that I would like to change, some things that need to change so that I can begin to experience the best yet in my life? How many of y'all want to experience the best yet in your life? How many of us want to get to a place where it's just kind of like, I'm tired of the up and down roller coaster in my life. I would like a consistent up. How many of y'all would like that consistent up growth development? But we get to a place where it's like, I'm up and I'm down and I'm up and I'm happy and I'm, uh, uh, and it just, we got to, we can evaluate. And, and even though life has mountain tops and valley lows, our emotions don't have to be mountain top and valley low. Our mindset doesn't have to be mountain top and valley lows. We can have a, an understanding that if God be for us, Two of y'all got it. Come on. If God be for us, who can be against us? And we can live a life pleasing unto the Lord, right, if we get into the system of doing things on how God desires for them, right? And so it's kind of like the system that we have in our own household. And if our kids could get an understanding of our system, things would go so much better one day. And parents say... Amen. <laughs> and so we have systems, right? We have functions and the way that we desire our household to operate. And God the Father has systems in which he desires for the universe to function. And so if we can get into the system that God has designed, then we will be able to live more better. Somebody say more better. I should have coined that phrase because now there is a restaurant like a Norman called Mo Better. I, I think they got it from watching it live. <laughs> All right, so let's see if this is a topic on today that we will be discussing that matches your life. What do you do when you are trying to make moves, but then you find yourself with your back against the wall? See, so often in our lives, we make decisions to do things. We make decisions to step out. We make decisions to leave some relationships. We make some decisions to make better financial decisions. We make some decisions to, to uh, better our education. We make some decisions so that our life can be different than what we have known. But so often when we make some of those decisions, we wind up with our back against the wall and we're figuring out what happened. Where did I go wrong? Where did I miss it? And we begin to say things, I should have stayed where I was. How many of us have ever said that before? Or I jumped from the frying pan to the fire. Or, or some of us are just kind of like, listen, I should have just stayed where I was at even though it just about killed me. I felt more comfortable there than I do here. See, in our lives, when we get to a place that our backs are against the wall, we prefer to go back to where we were even though it's dysfunctional, even though it's poisonous to our thoughts, even though it's no good for us, even though all of the negativity was a part of that 
season, we prefer to be there than to be here. Why? Because we don't like the pressures of life. How many of you like the pressure of life? No one will raise their hand, maybe one or two, and then I will question why in the world would you like pressures of life? Help me understand that, would you? This is how it constantly is in our life. We try to step out on what we call faith, but we get uh, on our journey and we wind up feeling like we've arrived to an, a dead end. Am I talking to anyone in this place today? We are a people that oftentimes are quicker to see a roadblock than an opportunity. If I asked you to make a long list of good things that are going on in your life, it would probably be a few sentences. But if I began to ask you to make a list of the negative things going on in your life, you would probably need several of those journal books to fill it all out. And so God is desiring much better for us. We just have to see that God wants more for us and we have to desire more for ourselves. So I want, there's some people that I want to introduce to you today that can relate with us on this topic. We will discuss today the Israelites and their time in bondage under the Egyptian power. They were in slavery, y'all, for 430 years. 430 years in bondage. 430 years having to be under the oppression of the Egyptian people. And here's the deal. The Israelites were only taken into bondage because they were growing in number and they were being blessed of God. And the Egyptians said, well, if we allow them to grow anymore, they're they're going to enslave us. And so in their fear of feeling like they were going to be oppressed, they decided to take the Israelites into slavery. And then now fast forward 430 years, Moses becomes the spoke person so that the Israelites would be able to be released from being in bondage and being in slavery. And so God's desire for them in the season was God desired for them to have their own land. And God desired for them to be free. And God desired for the forefathers and the patriarchs to begin to build their own legacy. Isn't, awesome, isn't it awesome about God that he would desire all of these good things for his people? Now, true or false question. This is a true or false question. How many of you like taking exams, right? That's another one of those questions. Like, if you do, please tell me why. I don't know. These are some things that we will have to ask God. God, why did they like taking tests? It's not. True or false question. Do we as people desire to win as much as God wants us to win? In theory, the answer to that is it is true. We all desire to win as much as God wants us to win. Now, this is what happens, that when we begin to walk it out just a little bit and the pressures of life kick in, we begin to backpedal and begin to shift our thought of, of understanding that as we navigate, if you really wanted to win, you will push forward, but we begin to get into a stuck season and in a transitional period that keeps us in bondage and oppression and in slavery. God wants us to be free, but do you want to be free? Right? Because we, we like all of the stuff that's at that free place. And we like all of the, the, the nice environments and the culture of, of not being in bondage. But the moment that the enemy shows up and we hit a block, all of a sudden all that God desires for us is out the window. And we go right back to the place of where we were. Exodus chapter 14 verse 10. And when Pharaoh drew near, the children of Israel lifted their eyes, and behold, the Egyptians marched after them. So let me lay down a little bit of the scene, right? I love telling stories. I love a good story. And so at this point, the Israelites, they were out of Egypt. They were on their way to the promised land. And uh, everything seemed to be going okay up to this point. As the Israelites were marching, they picked up their head and they realized that the Egyptians were hot on their trail. And all of a sudden, this is where the rubber meets the road. And so they were afraid. And the children of Israel cried out to God. 
Verse 11, then they said to Moses, because there were no graves in Egypt, have you taken us away to die in the wilderness? Why have you so dealt with us so to bring us up out of Egypt? Now the people immediately, they see, they wanted the freedom. How many of us want freedom in the house? How many of us want freedom online? We want the freedom. We want to be able to progress. We want, we want the, the sky's the limit. We want too blessed to be stressed. We want to grow. We want, ah, we want all the good stuff. Somebody say, ah. We want all the good stuff. How many of y'all like the good stuff? How many of y'all like the happy, happy, joy, joy? Until you pick up your head and you realize that the enemy was hot on your trail. And, and you weren't alone on this journey. And, and, and you were, you were uh, uh, being chased down now because how, you know that the devil will not just lay down while you're trying to change your life. You do realize that, right? It seems like just when you begin to do what God has called you to do, the devil shows up. He wasn't bothering you when you weren't doing nothing. He wasn't bothering you when you were just trying to chill out. He wasn't bothering you when you weren't doing what God had called you to do. He was, he was kind of leaving you alone even when you were in your addiction. He was leaving you alone when your marriage was all messed up. You're like, well, the devil was. No, listen, that was us being argumentative and being negative. Sometimes the devil ain't in our marriage. It's us. The devil ain't messing with you when you ain't going to church and when you ain't doing what you're supposed to be doing. He's leaving you alone. You are one of the players on his team. But all of a sudden now you have come out of the place that has been keeping you in bondage. And as you walk and all of a sudden you realize, uh-oh, he is hot on the trail. And then all of a sudden we're thinking to ourselves, God, what, what, I thought you wanted me to be free. I, I thought you wanted me to step out on faith and start this new thing. God, how in the world is it that now the enemy is hot on my trail? And then it's none of us in here. None of us in here cry out to God when we're going through stuff like that. You guys are people full of faith, and you guys are, you guys are saved and sanctified and filled with the Holy Ghost, a bunch of tongue talkers. You guys got it going on. When the worship goes on, you're like, hey, at the altar, just filling up. That, not none of you guys, none of you guys, none of you guys. We're talking about some other folks outside of here. We're, we're talking about folks outside of this place and so they're needing all of this encouragement and and Moses at this point he's starting to coddle them nobody like no one in here none of y'all go through the discouragement we never have to encourage encourage you over and over and motivate you over and over to keep about none of you we don't ever have to remind any of you about God's faithfulness on how he's called you and that he has greater for you that if he be for you then who could be against you none of y'all in here have ever experienced this we're talking about other people outside of here Moses was dealing with these folks encouraging them motivating them coddling them it's going to be all right Y'all can do it. I know that he's hot on your trail, but don't worry about it. You can do all things through Christ Jesus who is your strength. And he's reminding them of the faithfulness. And, and then these folks are, these folks are a little cray-cray. Not like any of y'all. Y'all, y'all are. <laughs> Exodus chapter 14, verse 12, this is what these folks begin to say. It, it blows my mind. Is this not the word that we told you in Egypt? Now, the folks are talking to Moses, and we, they, he's saying, listen, we already done told you in Egypt, and we are going to remind you again, let us alone that we may serve the Egyptians. Wow. For it would be better for us to serve the Egyptians than that we should die in the wilderness. Now, they're in freedom 
at this current moment. Do you realize that? Like they are not in bondage. They're not having to cut rocks. They don't have no whips on their backside. They can do whatever they want. They can tell their kids whatever they want to. They are in freedom. They've come a long way, 430 years, and now they're on their way to their own land. They're on their way to creating their own new memories. And at that point, they begin to look and see that the adversary and the enemy is approaching them. And all of a sudden, sudden they're saying you should have left me a slave then t- are you here you should have left me a slave I just want to be a slave I don't want freedom I don't want to have to go through the challenges I don't want to have to fight against Satan I don't want to have to deal with the the lack of motivation and the lack of self-esteem and the lack of value I just want to stay where I was it was all good there although it wasn't good there See, in our life, there are places and seasons in our life that we, you, you could have just about lost your life, but somehow you found comfort there. Somehow you become institutionalized in life and a place where you could have died, you prefer to be there than to be at a place of freedom. And the Egyptians are saying, listen, you should have just left me over there, and you, but you brought me here to die. Can I let you know that freedom has a price? I don't care what you got to say about this land. People died so that we can experience the very little freedom that somebody would say we have. It, there was a price to it. There was a bloodshed. In fact, here, let me paint a better picture for you. This is how a good example of how when you are looking for freedom, you lose before you win. Are you ready? <laughs> when you want to gain freedom from addiction and you begin to go through withdrawal, it doesn't feel like you're winning. It feels like you're losing, as a matter of fact. It's kind of like when you're trying to clean a closet in your house. How many of y'all have ever cleaned the closet? How many of y'all have a closet right now you got to clean? How many of y'all like to clean closets? I have a closet, a few closets at my house. If y'all could help me out, I would love for you to help me out. <laughs> and, so, and so you lose before you actually begin to experience win. To get... Free from a domestic violence situation, you have to lose the life that you know and lose the relationship that you were hoping would work out before you could begin to experience a level of freedom. (laughs) Listen, you lose before you win, but some of us just want to grab on to he whom the sun sets free. I'm free. And you walk up out of here expecting everything to be A-OK. And all of a sudden, the debt collectors are not going to call you any longer. And the car is actually going to crank on the first turn. And and, and all the you got three colors on your car, rust, white, and primer. And all of a sudden, they combine and are one color. And nobody talks about you anymore. and, And it's all good. No more leaky faucets. You currently have all of the hot water that you've needed. The AC is blowing like you wouldn't believe it and every I'm free free does not look like that when you first step into freedom see some of us want to be free from negativity but still speak negative you 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 got to you want to be free from negativity you got to lose the negativity and begin to pull on some positive listen if all we do is speak all of these word curses over our life and this is what happens you have this negative mindset and everywhere you go you like look at that look at this over here look at you go to the next room as a matter of fact there's a, a funny story that I just remember now I think it's going to be funny I don't know how if you're going to think it's funny so there was this man, he, was, he fell asleep, and, and uh, he was on his favorite recliner. I have a, a favorite recliner at the house, and nobody respects the, 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 my recliner. Everybody just sits in it and beats me to this recliner. But this, this, this man, he fell asleep on a recliner, and his grandchildren decided that they wanted to play a trick on him. And so they got this cheese called Fumunga cheese. And I don't know if you know anything about cheeses, but this cheese did not smell very good. It had a very, very foul odor. And so the grandchildren rubbed it on grandpa's upper lip. And long and behold, grandpa woke up after a few hours of napping, 
And, uh, and he was like, man, it's, there's a bad odor in this room. I'm not understanding, but it smells really, really bad. And, and so grandpa gets up out of there. He's like, I got to leave this room because it smells so bad. And he goes into the next room, and it smells as bad in there. But he keeps making it worse because he keeps poking out his lips like, what? <laughs> It smells so bad. And then, and then he goes into the next room, and every room smells exactly the same. He's like, I can't even live in this house. We're just going to have to turn this thing. I got to move. I can't do I can't live in this place. He goes outside, and it smells the exact same way. And Grandpa says, the whole world stinks. This is how our lives are sometimes. And everywhere that we go, we see an issue. And everywhere that we go, we see a problem. And there's always everybody else. And why do you, everywhere I go, I have an argument with somebody. <laughs> Can I let y'all in on a tad bit little secret? If everywhere you go, <laughs> you argue with everybody, it ain't them. <laughs> it's you. <laughs> And so to gain freedom from negativity, you got to lose the negativity. And, and to gain freedom and complete deliverance, it requires you losing the chains and getting healing for yourself. You know, I, I, I'm a city slicker. I uh, grew up in New York City. I've lived in, in everywhere I've lived there's been a city. I, I don't know if I'll be able to survive in a country is too far from the city. And um, I, I don't like all of the landscape and stuff. It's just too much for me. It's too hot out there. I don't like the smell of freshly cut grass. But I have a garden, y'all. And I have mastered dealing with my garden. I, I have learned. See, last year I didn't do so well, y'all. This is what happened last year. I put seeds in the ground, Chris, but I put them in too late. And by the time they started to grow, it was like August, and I'm like, man, I just, I can't do this. I'm, so I've mastered it. Are y'all ready? I bought plants that somebody else grew, and I planted those, y'all. <laughs> and my garden right now, I put some miracle grow on that thing, and I watered that bad boy, and my plants are like this high, and my tomatoes are growing, and the cilantro. And so I found the cheat code to gardening, y'all. Woo! I celebrate myself. <laughs> but this is, this is what I did. I messed up still. I still messed up because at the beginning, I pulled up all of the weeds in the garden and all of that stuff. But I wasn't like grabbing the weeds and throwing them off the garden. I was pulling the weeds and just kind of leaving them there. And I'm like, oh, they'll dry up. You know what I mean? I, again, just not even understanding this whole dynamic of how this thing works. I just, I'm thinking about the cilantro and the peppers and the tomatoes. And I did some watermelon and melon. And I'm like, I can't wait for this. And so I'm pulling the weeds, but I'm leaving it in the garden. And, and, and I thought that they would dry up. But guess what them bad boys did? They rerooted themselves. I'm like, where did y'all come from? I thought I pulled y'all already two weeks ago. And, and I realized that this is how we are in our life. There's some things that we pull up, but we leave right near us where we can reach them again. And there's some people that we pull up out of our life, but we keep them within arm's reach. And there's some things that we battle with that we, we pull up and we say, I'm not going to deal with you no more. And then they're right beside you just in case you need. There's some bridges that you have to begin to burn. And like my garden, if you don't uproot it and pull it out, guess what you're going to have to deal with again? The same issues all over again. You want freedom? You got to lose first. And some of us don't like losing a whole lot, but some of us, before you can win, you got to begin to learn how to lose. And then just when we thought that things couldn't get any worse for the Israelites... They're navigating through. They left Egypt. The Egyptians are hot on their trail. And they've gone as far as they can go. And now on one side is the sea. And on the other side is the Egyptian. And the space between the two is getting smaller and smaller and smaller. 
See, there are a period of times in our life when we look and think that we've reached a dead end. Or there's times in our life where we feel like we cannot go any further, that we think that we're cornered. That we begin to think like, what now? There's no way out of this. I'm finished. I'm finished. The Israelites were crying out to God. What do we do now? Where do we go to now? Who, who do we call? There's a sea in front of us. If we want to get across this thing, we're going to have to all swim. It's an ocean, a sea. They didn't see opportunity beyond the adversary or beyond the opposition. All they saw was that now they could not go any further. They've gone as far as they can go. The enemy is closing in. What do I do now? Have you ever been at that place or are you there now? Where do you go from here? What do you do? You've taken the step of faith. You've gone out way on the limb. You've done things that you've never done before and now you feel like you have gone as far as you can go. You don't know what else to do. What do we do next? Where do we go to next? We're crying out to God and we're thinking to ourselves, God, do you even hear me? You are the God of the heavens and the earth. God, you're very much alive and you're answering everybody else's prayers, but can you listen to mine? So I want to share six things with you that you can begin to apply, ensuring that you move forward. Write these down and don't lose these. Number one, learn to take risks. See, before we came to God, we were risk takers. Were y'all risk takers? You'd get in a car and go see people that you knew were, you didn't know if you were going to come back alive. <laughs> Two dollars a gas. <laughs> We, we go and we do things. We are very risky when we were in the world, weren't we? And all of a sudden, we come to God and we're like, oh, I don't know. We become spiritually schizophrenic. Like, we don't oh, no, I don't. I can't, I can't. I don't know if I could do that. I, I can't. All of a sudden, we become timid. But we need to begin in our life and our journey following God, we have to become risk takers and take steps that wouldn't be normal otherwise. But if God be for us, then who can be against us? These are things that we have to be reminded of as we take a step and as we continue you to step. Uh, can I let you know uh, uh, a little secret of my life and how I navigate? Every day is a risk for me. Every day I'm trying to figure out what different can I do today that I didn't do yesterday. See, some of us think that we're just taking a risk by taking a first step. Your second step is a risk also. And your third step and your fourth step. And every time you step is a risk or should be a risk. And if you stop on the third step, God is looking down and he's like, you should have kept going because your blessing was on the fifth step. Some of us just got to keep going and take risks. We look at successful people and we want to be just like, the, we're in a time right now of comparison and want to be like everybody else. But do you realize that half of them took a risk? If not them, their parents did because there's new money, there's old money. Somebody did something to get to that place. Number two, we got to fight against the comfort zone. Fight against that comfort zone. We like to be comfortable too much. We just want to be hanging out with our feet up and, and just chilling out and everything okay. We got to push beyond the comfortable. In fact, we ought to live at a place of the uncomfortable because it's the uncomfortable that will keep us going. Sometimes when we're too comfortable, we stay at mom's house. When we're too comfortable, we stay at my, our dad's house. When we're too comfortable, we just, we just allow ourselves to just, to just stay where we are. Why? Because, because we're good here and we don't have to push against the grain at the place I'm at. It's all good. I'm comfortable. You even sound it all out, comfortable. <laughs> Number three, don't postpone your goals. Well, I had kids, and so I had to change a little bit of what my goals were. Well, you know, things happen, and so I had to hold on to my goals just a little bit, and I had to postpone my goals. Listen, if I could talk you out of your passion, it ain't your passion. 
If I could talk you out of accomplishing your goals, they ain't your goals. In fact, those things that you say stopped you from reaching your goals, those should be what makes you push to achieve your goals. Number four, break routines. Routines make you lazy. And cause you to become a procrastinator. Number five, learn what makes you unique. It's okay to see the model of how someone else is living. It's not okay to want to be just like, if you're looking and thinking like, man, I want to be like Pastor G, I'm telling you right now, no, you don't. <laughs> My wife was second that motion. <laughs> learn what makes you unique. Be okay with what makes you different. I'm the only Guillermo Rivera. There may be some other people with my name, but there ain't nobody like me. There's only one of me, and I'm okay with that. I have a unique fingerprint. I have a way of speaking, a way of moving. I have an anointing over my life that is not like anyone else's. Listen, I have to enjoy the uniqueness of my life, and the more I try to be like someone else, the less I am like God created me to be, and I lose what God desires for me to do. Are you okay with being you? It doesn't matter when you look in the mirror and you feel like you're a little too wide or a little too tall or your hair is too curly or you wish you would have had blue eyes or blonde eyes. Uh, uh, blonde eyes. Blonde, <laughs> blonde hair. You have to be okay with the way that God created you. Otherwise, you spend your life trying to be like everyone else and you miss out on the best days of your life. And number six, discover new dreams. Here's the deal with discovering new dreams. When I was a child, I thought like a child. But now that I'm a grown man, I think like a man. If some of my dreams and goals are for when I was five, I might need a little help in the area of development because when I was five, I wanted to go to the ice cream store and the candy store, and those were the goals for my day. Today, it is very much different. There are some new goals that I grab onto. There's maturity now that I can grab onto, and God allows me to see new things that I ought to desire and ought to want. I have a goal for my children. I have a goal for leaving a legacy. I have a goal for accomplishing what God has in store. I have a goal that when my time is over and done, that somebody comes and takes over this ministry to a greater place than what God could use me. These are goals that I didn't have when I was a child, and I didn't know to have those. But now that I am a man and I know, what goals do you have now as an adult? So we got to press forward. But those are six characteristics that you can apply, and I'm sure that there are more, but those are the ones that I will, I'll share with you today. But, but you got to press forward, and even though you feel like you've hit a dead end, it's not over until it's over. It's not over until God says it's over, and every day that you wake up is a new opportunity for you to accomplish all that God has in mind. As long as you woke up this morning, it's another opportunity for you to continue to do what God has called you to you woke up this morning, God ain't done with you yet. You're going through hardships, that's another opportunity for God to show his glory. And so if you see a brick wall, that's nothing uh, more than the enemy trying to show the, 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 the smoke and mirrors to try to keep you thinking like you're trapped. But you're not trapped. Your obedience is being tested. Exodus 14 Verse 21 through 22 says, Then Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and the Lord caused the sea to go back. I love that because it says, Moses stretched out his hand, and who pushed the sea back? They got it over there. Y'all, I could still see a little bit of smoke coming out of your ears, right? And so Moses raised up his staff, and who split the Red Sea? And so oftentimes we're trying to gain off of our own strength and thinking like, I don't know if I could do this and I don't know if I can accomplish it. You're right, you can't. But as long as you are in obedience, it is God who will split the seeds. It says, cause the sea to, uh, cause, 
the Lord caused the sea to go back by a strong east wind all that night and make the sea into dry land. And the waters were divided, so the children of Israel went into the midst of the sea on the dry ground, and the waters were a wall to them on their right hand and on their left hand. I would have loved to be there. Anybody else? Some people are like, no, I'm cool. I'm cool. I would have, everybody would have been like, we got to go. The Egyptians are coming. We got to head out. I would have been like, look at the wall. Ooh, look at the pretty little fish. Because uh, it wasn't like a little bit of water, y'all. Like, we're talking about a sea. Did I say it was a sea? It's a sea. The waters were high, and they were being pushed back. And so there are waves on the shore, right? What do you think was going on at that moment? It wasn't like something simple and something easy. There was now a barrier, a wall that God created with the sea. Did I say the sea? I'm sure they probably can see little fish and all of the stuff that you don't see normally at the bottom of the sea. You know only 2 or 3% of the sea has been discovered, right? And so all of that stuff at the bottom that we wonder what is down there, they were able to be at that place. God divided the sea and they walked across on dry ground. It was not muddy. They weren't tracking any dirt. They weren't tracking any mud. It, it was dry. It was like a little squeegee. Er, er. And millions of Israelites. It was not 10, 15. It was not 30 or 50 or 100. It was an entire nation that went across. anyone with their natural eye would have thought that they were trapped. That they weren't going to be able to get across. See, what we see with our natural eye most often plays tricks on us. Oftentimes we think that Satan is trying to get us our flesh, feed our flesh and, and just distract our flesh and all of that stuff. No, the, the devil don't care nothing about the flesh. Your flesh goes after its desires all by itself. Most of us in this room, it's not a Satan problem, it's a discipline problem. We lack the discipline to fight our flesh. So Satan is not fighting against your flesh. This is what, what is happening on the inside of you. Satan is just bringing a distressful spirit upon you and as long as you're under distress then you can't do what God has called you to do see he don't care about your flesh and like taking food from you and be like oh God I need for you to provide no it's not he doesn't not provide or or keep food from you so that you starve no he keeps a, a financial problem in front of you so that you can be distressed men how do you feel when you can't provide Man, how do you feel like when you've had a bad week at work? Man, how do you feel when, when you lack work or you've lost work? The devil didn't mess with your employment because he just is trying to mess with your flesh or, or your belly. He's just trying to distress you. Mama, yo, the devil don't care none about your babies. There's not much love like a, the love of a mama. He, he doesn't attract or attack our kids because he's just trying to attack our kids. No, he's trying to distress you, mom. And he's trying to get you to a place where, where your emotions are messed with. And, and if you're an emotional wreck, it, it's kind of like, a school teacher that messes with your kid and, and hurt them at school. You forgot that they did something bad. And you're about to fight the teacher now. Because they messed with your baby. You forgot that you went to church on Sunday. You forgot how much you put in the tithing basket. 
You forgot that you led a family group or that you even read your Bible that day. You all of a sudden learn how to speak French. <laughs> and I'm saying all of these things in a humorous way, but am I speaking the truth? See, here are characteristics of distress. Feelings of anger or hopelessness. Feelings of depression and anxiety. Difficulty sleeping. Feeling abandoned by God. Questioning the meaning of life or suffering. Questioning beliefs or sudden doubt in spiritual or religious beliefs. Asking why this situation occurred. These are just a few. Of the distress that comes upon us and our minds and, and our thoughts. And, and, and it, if he could just keep us at that place, then we are not in position to be used of God. Not because God can't use you, but because you are now no longer in a position to be used of God because you're in distress. So the enemy is closing in and you feel like you're at a dead end. You can either figure a way to push through or you can stand there and die. See, some of us pr prefer to go back to the, to the person or the people or the things that had us enslaved. But I'd rather die pushing through than die at the hand of somebody else. I'd rather push through and allow myself to, to, to figure out how to get to the other side with the help of God than to go back and put my faith in something or someone else. See, some of us got to push harder. Believe harder. Stand firmer. Not just lay down to the things that have been trying to take you out. When will we do it? Because I'm again, we can go back and look at all the things that are going wrong in our life, but can we look at what is going right in our life? I mean, you made it here today. See, I know that y'all love God. You know how I know? Because I've seen all your faces several times. See, there's couples that we counsel, myself and, and my wife, and and they're just kind of like, I can't stand them, I hate them. It's the truth. I don't like them, I don't love them, I'm done with it. I'm like, well, you love them enough to marry them. So we know love is possible because there was love one time before. And so we take that same principle, and even though some of us may feel like we're at a hard place right now, you believed and trusted in God at one point in your life. You believed and trusted that he could be your savior. And so many of you raised your hand for salvation. And, and you have believed that he can get you through. And so you continue this journey over and over. And you show up week after week after week. So you have believed at one point that God can bring you through. So it's possible. And so we stand here mid-year. And we say, God, if you've done it before in my life, then I'm going to believe that you're going to do it again. And you've brought me through before, God, then I know that you can bring me through again. And if you brought me through times like this before, then God, I know, I know that you can do it again. I wish I could take the credit and say, you guys are all here because I'm such an amazing preacher. But I can't. Because it's not my preaching that brings you back. It's the word of God. It's the love of God. It's the embrace of God. It's the care of God. It's the, it's the warmth of who he is and who he has been in your life. Listen, he loves you more than any spouse can ever love you. His hug and embrace is greater than any child can give to you. His care. I, listen, ladies, I know that he probably brings you some flowers, but I promise you that he doesn't love you more than King Jesus. And husband, she may make an amazing chili mac. But there's no greater love than the love of Jesus. And then we, when we can grab onto that and we can allow that understanding to be buried in our hearts, then we can say, God, I know it hasn't been good up to this point, but I, but I want to 
I want to grab onto your coattail and believe that the rest of this year is going to be greater than what I've experienced thus far. And why, why stop at the six months? That's just a short-term goal. If you could do it for six months, then you could do it for a year. And if you could do it for a year, then you could do it for five, and you could do it for ten, and, and it can be a part of your life. You can win every day of your life, although you feel like sometimes you're losing. Why? Because you got to lose before you win. See, all of us want a victory, but there's got to be a battle before there's a victory. You can't win unless you've competed. Greater is ahead. But you got to believe it. In the name of Jesus, every head bowed and every eye closed. God, we love you and we honor you and we stand on your promises, God. God, we need you. We, we, we need you. There's no way around it. There's no ifs, ands, and buts, my God. We need you to be with us, God. Some of us in this place, our backs are against the wall where the enemy is closing in. We feel like we have nowhere to turn, nowhere to go. But God, I pray that in the name of Jesus that you would split the sea for every single person in this place, my God. Lord, we believe that on the other side of this opposition is the promised land. We will not give in. We will not give up. We will not give out. We will push through, God. You've been faithful before. And I know that you will be faithful again. Restore our strength. Restore our minds, God. May we believe that we can because you are with us. With every head bowed and every eye closed, if you're in this place, you're watching us online and you're saying, listen, I've, I've tried this thing for a long time all by myself. I, I've had my questions about faith. I, I just don't know where to turn, but I'm willing to give Jesus a try. I, I might as well. I've tried everything else. I, I'll give him a try. If you're in this place or you're watching us online and you're saying, I want to receive him as Lord and Savior of my life. I want to give this a try. That's you. Just slip up your hand right where you are. We won't embarrass you. We'll pray with you. Is there anyone in the room? that would say, I want to receive Jesus as Lord and Savior of my life. Perhaps you're in here and you've fallen away and you're, you've known God, you've made a decision to follow him, but now you're saying, you know what, I, I realize that I've been gone way too long. It's time for me to come on back home. If that's you, just slip up your hand. Is there anyone in the house or online that would say, I'm ready to rededicate myself? Hallelujah. God, we just honor you and we thank you, God for being our God. We thank you, God, that we get to serve you and honor you and worship you because you alone deserve it. God, may this message be buried in our hearts in the name of Jesus. And everyone says, amen. Really quick, I have a certificate today before service. We had the awesome, awesome privilege and opportunity to baptize Louisa. And so you guys celebrate with her. Louisa has uh, been navigating uh, through, some, uh, through some challenges, and she's like, it's time for me to get baptized. And, and so we have this certificate that we want to present to you. And thank you so much for the decision on today and trusting us to navigate this with you. And so we love you so, so very much. And so you guys celebrate her again. <laughs> oh, awesome. We love you. And uh, listen, don't put off tomorrow what you should do today. Because tomorrow is never promised. In Jesus' name, thank you guys. You guys welcome, Joey. Thank you so much for being a part of our service on today. Listen, if you have any prayer needs, we would love to pray with you. So send them on over. Our hope and desire is that the message was an impact to you and your children and your entire household. We take our motto here seriously. Why do life alone? Listen, there's no reason why you should do life alone. So come and be a part of do us. Let's do life together. <laughs>